she was only going to be a storybook character. And I literally scoured the internet to find out which of my friends would be performing her on the show. And I found an article that said she's not going to be a character on the show, which was fine. But then it was just like, oh, man, I kind of had the realization that she looked like me. I just kind of I literally looked up at my ceiling fan and I was like, hey, universe, I would like this someday. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity. And today we have on the show, Stacey Gordon. Welcome to the show, Stacey. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me today. It is it is so good to have you here. For anyone who doesn't know, Stacy Gordon is a puppeteer out of Arizona. Uh, she's the creator of the Puppet Pie Studio. She is a fixture of the P of A festivals and Dragon Con, uh, and of course also performs on Sesame Street as um, Julia. And it is so wonderful to finally have you here, Stacy Gordon. Welcome to Puppet Tears. Thank you. I'm ready to cry. No need for that, just yet at least. <laughs> but uh, what are you up to right now? In this very moment, let's see. I am in the middle of getting my uh, ice cream truck finished up. That's uh, in the next couple of weeks, which I've been saying since November. So we'll see. Yeah, um, let, let, let's unpack that for people a little bit because you're not yeah. you're not going into the ice cream selling business. They might be confused by that. <laughs> You could say. Proximal, um, adjacent to. Yeah, yes. so, yeah. <laughs> so about two years although, ago. Although you I, may have kids chasing your truck. <laughs> though it's not no, this is true. This is true. <laughs> right. uh, about two years ago, I, 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 well, maybe even more than that, I make a lot of food puppets. And I had started to turn my booth at the Phoenix um, Fan Fusion, which is our Comic-Con. Um, I had started kind of to turn it into like a little cafeteria. That's what it was starting to look like. And I was trying to think of ways to elevate that. And I thought, well, like a food cart would be fun. And then I thought, well, a food, food truck would be fun. And I started looking at, at campers and trailers. And then I found an ice cream truck. And I was like, this is it. This is what I want. And um, after many, many months of missing missing trucks and getting, you know, finding other trucks and missing those finally finally landed on one and we started restoring it last September um, and it's been a much bigger undertaking than I ever expected is it's a 1973 and a 1973 vehicle as you guys can probably guess a 1973 anything comes with a lot more challenges than one would expect so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're all old and breaking down at that point <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh my god! I, I had a car from 2000 that gave me a headache in uh, in college. I could only imagine having something from from the 70s. Yeah, yeah. So you know, we found a lot of rust. We've had to replace the entire floor, and and now now we're putting in the electrical. Um, I just rebuilt a window that we'll be putting in in the next couple of days, and the service window, which has another tiny window inside of it. So you can slide open the big window or you can slide open this really tiny window, um, which is just the bee's knees during COVID. But yeah, and That's I'll so be cool. I'm turning it into an art studio that can travel around to people's homes. And then I uh, it was just announced that I am the recipient of a research and development grant from the Arizona Commission on the Arts. And so I'll be able to use those funds to build a puppet show and outfit the truck with performance equipment. That's incredible. Wow, that's Congratulations. So cool. yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have yeah. any other plans that uh, that you could do with this? Because you know, it, you could have easily gone to people's homes in a regular car with a couple of bins of puppets and stuff and go in and do something, but having it on this truck turned into this puppet mobile uh, is such a spectacle, you know, it's like a, it's like a food truck, but for, for crafts, do, do you, how do you see yourself potentially really taking advantage of how that looks and how people would react to it? Well, so the original idea was not to turn it into an art studio or performance venue. It was to turn it into a food truck where people would walk up to it expecting to buy burritos or churros or other things you'd get from a food truck and instead they would be 
served a puppet burrito or a puppet churro, puppet taco. I, these are things I already make. Um, and so, yeah, that was the original idea. And then when, when COVID hit, I just thought, man, I've, I've got to let this thing go. That's really unfortunate because I'm going to need, I'm going to need this money to pay my rent while my art studio is shut down. And my, my dad actually had the idea. He said, you know, could you use it somehow during the pandemic? And, you know, the answer is yes, if I can get it done before the pandemic is over, but you know, at least the world is giving me a good opportunity to get it done by carrying about out a pandemic. So, <laughs> oh. what yeah. was your pandemic project? Oh, I restored a <laughs> an, an ice cream truck yeah. from 1973 into a puppet mobile. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Well, that is so cool. I'm in my I'm in my 40s, and so I've been saying that it's I I couldn't find a more whimsical midlife crisis, so I decided to go with this one. That's so cool. So that's your inspiration for this kind of surprises me in a little bit. It's almost like a really expensive gag. It's like they came <laughs> expecting to get food and they walk away hungry, but w with a smile because <laughs> yeah, they I, get a puppet I, instead. <laughs> I'm more trying to think of it as like an expensive art project, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I could see, I mean, the, oh, first, I mean, it's just so cool. You know, I could see going to any any kind of art festival, music yeah. festival, pretty much anywhere where there would be like a food truck thing. There's food truck festivals and like uh, yeah. events and oh, stuff. Yeah. And going there and being able to do small performances and and selling some of your your things. Like I just think it's yeah, it's really it's just like a craft show tent, but on wheels that you get to do do it wherever you want. If you're just free on the weekend in the summer you're like hey i'm just gonna go to the park and do little puppet shows with my mobile theater th oh my god it's just so cool I, yeah. I, everything about it i love uh, well Thank and i you. also love how true it is to your own mm. brand and like if you if you would ask me like wh who's a puppeteer you know who would you know trick out an ice cream truck like this you are like on the top one, two, and three spots for a project <laughs> like this. Like it is so true to who you are and your artistic aesthetic. And as you mentioned, you are already doing these kinds of puppets and stuff. It's just, it's such a wonderful marriage of like intention and execution. Uh, I, I just love it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, it's one of those things where I'm just glad that my husband agreed to it. <laughs> <laughs> Because originally I was looking at trailers and at the time, I mean, now they're all expensive, but at the time I was looking, they were about $600. And so instead of a $600, you know, $1,000 investment, now we're 10 times, more than 10 times that. So wow. it's, I know it's, it, car, trucks are expensive, man. Like sheet metal st stuff's not cheap, but I really, really think that it's going to be something it's pretty spectacular when it's done. So um, oh, it yeah. does have a paint job. I'm just waiting for the reveal on that until it's mm. all the way done. Ooh. Yeah. We'll definitely uh, make sure to, to share it on our, our social media channels and such when it's when it's up and, and ready to be seen. So we can't, can't how, wait to see do it. Do you have any plans? Like, how, how far do you plan on going with it? Like, what's the furthest? Um, just obviously depends on, you know, yeah. what, what, what they, what the, who calls you and, and what the gig is. But, like, where, how far do you see yourself going with it? So, so distance wise, I was asked if I could bring it up to a little town called Wickenburg, um, which is the for, it was the first capital of Arizona and it's up in the mountains. And I was like, you know, I don't, even if it's done by mid June, I don't know if I'm going to feel comfortable driving it in the mountains just yet. So I figure Phoenix area for now. And then as, as I see how it drives, how comfortable I am driving a giant you know, it, it's a Chevy, Chevy P20. It's it's pretty big. So see how comfortable I am driving it before I commit to anything super <laughs> yeah. far away. <laughs> they always need a good food truck at the O'Neill Center. So, yeah. you know, next know. puppetry well, conference. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I have memories. I've only been to the O'Neill once, but one of my favorite memories is walking over to the beach and seeing the ice cream truck parked in the sand on the edge there. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it's just a magical experience to walk up to a, an ice cream truck. 
I mean, as kids, I think we all had that, you know, it's, I got butterflies in my tummy just asking like, oh, what do I want? And practicing, practicing saying it in my head, like, I need a drumstick, please, you know, <laughs> like, and handing over the money and all that. It's, and I, I think that as adults, we, we don't want to lose any of our childhood magic. And when we, when we can grab at it again, we really try to. Um, it's one reason that, you know, there's all these puppeteers who are adults. We're all, we're all magic grabbers. No, I, I love that. And, um, Consensual magic grabbers. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important distinction. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> um, no, but I, I love that. And um, yeah, I mean, you still, you hear an ice cream truck going down your street and there's like that yeah. Pavlovian like oh I'm excited now like, yeah, like just <laughs> just knowing that it's like oh it's summertime it's like oh, I can get ice cream I'm like I'm an adult I can just go drive and get ice cream anywhere I want whenever I want it's like but still it just taps into the back of your mind that nostalgic mm -hmm. anytime I smell those fumes those terrible <laughs> fumes from the back of the truck it just like oh it just reminds me of my childhood <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As a puppeteer now, I've, I've moved on to different fumes, all right. the fumes that involved <laughs> in creating right. a puppet. So That's right. That's right. All the barge and, yeah. Yes. <laughs> totally. Barge totally. thinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how how did all the puppetry stuff get started for you? Um, so when I was a kid, I was kind of surrounded by makers of, of magic, um, if, we keep, if we keep going with that analogy. My grandfather carved marionettes and my mom made porcelain dolls and cloth dolls and my aunt crocheted. I have my first puppet that I ever got. Here we go. Okay, so oh, this, this is, great. is the very first puppet I ever got and it's a handmade it's it's the pattern for uh, it's a crocheted pattern for lamb chop. My oh. sister got the one that looked identical to lamb chop, and I got the black sheep. And I, you know, I was so little. I pulled out the tongue and the paws over time. You know, as the felt started getting a little, a little wonky. But you know, I got this before I could talk. Like there's, I've always had puppets in my life, and. When I was in high school and told my mom that I wanted to build, you know, I wanted puppets for our church, she was like, okay, she didn't bat an eye. She was like, you know, you're going to help me make them. But, but she really, she really was on board. And when I told her that I, I wanted to drop out of school and do theater, she was like, I love theater. And, you know, when I said I wanted to be a puppeteer, she's like, that's great because all those doll and puppet museums we went to, you know, she, she never, Neither of my parents ever said, yeah, but you need a backup plan. Um, they, they always said, chase your dreams and be happy. No, that's, I love that. And, and to be surrounded by that is so important too. Like you yeah. were saying, the, between the crochet and, and the marionettes and all that sort of stuff, just to see, you know, seeing adults do it gives it a val validity that um, not everybody always always has. So I love that that relationship started so early for you. Yeah. Yeah. My mom took me to doll and teddy bear conventions and, you know, literally we went there, we went to a museum that was a doll museum and the, and the guy had these beautiful uh, hand carved marionettes of the last supper in a, in a tableau. And, you know, I can remember that really being the first time I I was like 16 when she brought me to these places. These weren't like, I mean, I, I did go when I was very little, but, but you know, she, she never wanted me to stop playing. Like she always wanted me to keep playing. I can remember, I can remember being far too old for Barbies and a friend of mine kind of teasing me for it. I think I was in, I think I was in like the sixth grade and my mom was just like, your friend is wrong. You play with those as long as you can because someday you're going to be an adult and you're not going to get to play anymore. And so hang on to it. And and I did. And I just didn't stop. I love that. I remember when I was in first grade being still really into the Muppets and Sesame Street and thinking to myself, just because I was seeing what all my friends were doing and into it, and I was like, 
I guess I'm going to have to stop liking this stuff pretty soon and just kept hitting the snooze button on that until it was like, wait a second. <laughs> like, I get I'm to so, write my own interests. <laughs> I'm so sad that you had you first had that feeling in the first or second grade because oh, yeah. it's, yeah. And I, I feel like I'm I'm a, a quite a few years older than you are. And I, I do see, like, I see my kids feeling the pressure to grow up faster and faster. And it's just a darn shame, you know? Yeah. It, it really is. And I, I've not had nearly as much experience as this guy has in a classroom. But that's always something that, like, whenever I saw the underdog getting picked on for whatever it was, because, you know, kids will just, you know, pick whatever they want to make someone feel like an other. And it's like, no, just give them – Give them the space. Like it's it's cool to think that something's cool. Like that's all it needs yeah. to be. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's one thing it just it's making me think about too. Is like sometimes you do outgrow things anyway too, right? Because <laughs> like I was thinking about like and, and like things that I thought was cool. Like when I was kid, I loved watching Power Rangers, and I know you're still a big fan of Power Rangers, right? I I I'm a fan of the props of it. Like I right. love yeah, having okay. a morpher, see, but like I don't see, like oh, see we're we're on par there cuz yeah. again like but if I went back and watched an episode, I'd be like <laughs> no, you're hate watching it the, at that point. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just like why this why I thought this was good. It wasn't good. It was cool. You just connect with things at a certain age, right? right. And some things like the Muppets uh, have been good enough to to still be good when you're older, right? So mm-hmm. it's interesting the things that we hold on to and, and why we don't hold on to things. And, and, and I think some people do that in reverse. They do let go of something that is still good because they feel like it's meant for somebody else too. Yeah. It's just so interesting. Right. Right. I mean, how many, how many, you know, nine year olds look at, uh, you know, Teletubbies or whatever. I don't know if nine year olds even know what Teletubbies are anymore, but like, and they look at those things and they're like, Oh, that's for babies. (laughs) <laughs> and a lot of it, a lot of it, some of it's sure you're no longer interested, but a lot of it's pressure from their friends, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's for babies. You know, gosh, totally. well, that's no, for yeah. babies. I want to be a baby. <laughs> <laughs> it was my sister's 27th birthday yesterday, and uh, I got her a handy dandy notebook uh, from someone on Etsy, you know, because she was just a huge fan of Blue's Clues. And it was like yeah. her fav- one of her favorite gifts was just like having that thing that connects you to a past version of yourself is just, it's, yeah, it's exciting. Totally. But, but totally. back to you. I mean, that's, <laughs> what I was going to say, that's why, that's why my studio is filled with toys, you know, yeah. like, you know, I've got, I've got the dolls that my mom made. I've got, you know, my Sesame Street Lego set. I've got a Sesame Street lamp. And, you know, just my Fisher Price tea set that I'm looking at up there, you know, it's just different, different things that bring back wonderful little memories of your childhood, you know, and and bring you those feelings of unfettered joy and, and unfettered joy inspires creativity. How can you, you know, there, there's only so much, there's only so much I can create in a boring office. So I'd rather have it filled with toys. I could not agree more with you on that um no, i love that but so when um as you were coming up and you you say to your parents like i you know i, I think i want to go into theater um what was was there an end game in that like were you already thinking puppetry were you thinking you know children's theater or anything like that or or what were your expectations of that uh pursuit um I have lived, this was a realization that I had a while ago, like recently, within the last year. I have lived a lot of my life with very few expectations. Um, I knew that I wanted to do theater, and so I would walk down that path and see what I found, that kind of thing. And I found children's theater that I did for a while, and then I found, I, I re-found puppetry but I found it for adults. I started doing slams at the Great Arizona Puppet Theater in 2001. Uh, maybe it was too early 2002, but I think I first saw, I first saw Preston Furter do um, one of his shows, Slavenly Peter, at the Great Arizona Puppet Theater, and it's a it's a show for adults. 
And I just, it just reignited everything I loved about puppetry in high school and my childhood and, and in college. And I, um, I, I just, I, I never told them I had a plan. I just said, this is what I want to do. And they said, it sounds great. You know, they, they never once questioned how I would eat. <laughs> Well, speaking of that, how did you eat? <laughs> because, you know, I, I'm just thinking about the, like, your story. It's very inspirational, but, you know, it's, sometimes it's a hard thing to, to follow because, like, you know, like someone, for someone like me, like, I, I do have the day job, and, and actually having that day job is the only way I was really, I'm really able to do my art as much as I want to because I don't have to rely on it, you're right? And uh, so, like, how, how did you manage to dodge doing that? Or I'm sure there was some aspects of, of doing that a little bit throughout along the way, without a doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I definitely, definitely worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I almost always had a day job. And then after I had my son, you know, you take time off to be a mom for a little bit. And then when he went back to school, um, when he actually started, that's what started him uh, at in preschool was I'd gotten a job at the Great Arizona Puppet Theater. So, so most of the things that I had done um, were were slams. I did a lot of puppet slams, which is a show for um, for adult audiences, short form puppetry for the two people who are listening that don't know, maybe. Um, I assume everyone else knows what a puppet slam is. It's an informed but, audience, but it's always good to, yeah, uh, to yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got some, we definitely Never. have some muggles listening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for all the muggles. So, um, yeah, so I, I was doing slams and then, you know, took time off to have a baby. And then the puppet theater needed someone. They needed a teaching artist and they knew that I was really good with children. Um, and then I, I worked for them for a little bit. Um, then I think the, the mark, the, the market crashed around two seven, 2007. And I went to school. I went to school. I went to work in my son's, uh, in my son's school, but doing puppetry, you know, it was, I, I did the after school program and I always, I, I still did puppetry on the side until I didn't need to. So and did, did was, you, just out of curiosity, when you said you did puppetry at the school, is that a position that you created then? No. So um, they all knew what I did, you know, in my spare time. And uh, I th they actually hired me in the high school to teach puppetry to freshmen. Um wow. So I was teaching freshmen and sophomores puppetry and mask making, um, which was that's really cool. So amazing that's and fun. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I just want to hang on that for a second, just because I'm. I think that's. I mean, that's inspiring to me. I think a lot of people would be like, "I'd love to do that." I'm going to start looking for schools that are hiring puppeteers. They're not, right? So not. like, how? So so they knew right. you. So they kind of created this for you. Would you have any advice for someone about how to? potentially try to facilitate something like that? Well, I would say if you're an art teacher, and, and it helps that I was at a Waldorf school, and Waldorf mm. education values yeah. puppetry. They value the performing arts. And so, you know, find a school that is arts-based that, that values what you do, whether it's puppetry or macrame, you know, and, and let them know you have the skills you know, and and I was just kind of doing it in our after school program with the kids, you know, oh, hey, we've got these these materials. Let's make a puppet with it. Um, and and then it they, you know, get noticed, be be good enough that you can't help but be noticed. Yeah. That's be kind enough that you can't help but be noticed, be helpful enough that you can't help but be noticed. I think those are probably the keys to almost everyone's success is, you know be good, be kind, be helpful. Um, yeah. That will get you far yeah. in life in anything you do, right. I think. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. I would recommend that to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, and the, yeah. I think the less that you demand of other people, like the less that you, you know, are kind of pestering anybody, and it makes them want to eventually bend over backwards for you when you say, like, hey, I, I am a puppeteer. Do you think, you know, this class or, you know, whatever um, would, would be good for your freshman or, or whatever the case may be? 
um, people end up finding a lot of generosity for people who they, um, you know, have kind of felt supported by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's even why I got hired with the Great Arizona Puppet Theater is because I was around and I was helpful. Um, you know, whenever I was around, I, I tried to be helpful and, and they knew that I was looking for part-time work and they were like, why don't you come puppeteer for us? And so I got to do traveling shows for a while and then, um, then, you know, wasn't able to for a bit, but <laughs> well, and it's interesting because, you know, I, I started an Etsy shop in 2006 um, Etsy began, I think, six months prior. I was going to say, I didn't know Etsy's been around that long. <laughs> oh, I've, yeah. I've, I've, Etsy's taken over the world, man. I, I know Have it seen has. Those I just didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Have oh they? Oh, man. I oh regret not getting gosh. any. Well, actually, actually uh, what, if, could you, before we get into that, I do want to talk about that, too. Just want to talk about, a little bit about more about Etsy, because it's one that I've never, I don't know that, I just, I, I, I started making an Etsy account once, and I just felt like, oh, my gosh, they, they nickel and dime you. Uh, can I just pay? I don't care how big it is. Give me one fee. It feels like there's a yeah. fee to post. There's a fee when you sell. There's a fee. There's like fees everywhere. I'm like, it's just too complicated for me. Like I'm stepping away. I'm just going to do an eBay once in a while and sell stuff on my own website to you. Now, I know there's an advantage to Etsy is as far as um, it's its own ecosystem. It's its own platform. There's buyers that are exclusively somewhat through Etsy, which is nice. They do some advertising for you. To you, what was what's the benefit to, to Etsy? So, so in the early days, um, <laughs> I'm like trying to say it naturally now, like, oh, in the early days, um, in the early days of Etsy, it was really good because I, I had a full-time job and I, d it wasn't something where I needed to make a storefront. I didn't need a website. Um, and back in the day, it was like 10 cents a listing, you know, and, and it would stay up for six months, something like that. And they, their fees weren't very high. Um, when, you know, as, as you grow, uh, and the, what I'd been saying <laughs> was um, everything for me came about really organically. So, so as I grew, you know, I, I was making puppets, but still on Etsy. I was working for the, you know, working on for the theater, working for the school, still on Etsy. I started my Etsy shop when my son was three, two and a half. He was two and a half. Um, so, you know, it was something I could do while he took a nap. And there was a really great community. It was a really small, tight knit community back then. And it was, it was almost like my lifeline to the outside world. And, and as a stay at home mom of a, of a little guy, it's almost like being in quarantine. That's kind of a good way to describe it. You just don't see anyone except when you're at the grocery store. And when you do, you're like, people, people who are big. This is nice. You speak English. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, it offered me something that I could do that was small, that, that I could do in my own time. Um, there was no pressure. And then, you know, as I walk down a path, as I am wont to do in my life and just see where it leads me, you know, like Etsy brought me out to teach a workshop in New York. And that was super fun, you know? Really? And, and that trip, that was in 2007. That trip is the very first time my child ever went to preschool. Um, yeah. So, so I, yeah, I went to New York. I taught at the Etsy headquarters. Um, they, they had me doing puppet shows for them on a, on a, on a uh, flash based video chat platform that they developed in 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. And, and as Etsy grew, um, I mean, at, at the point that I started, there were three puppet makers on Etsy and we all made finger puppets. I was the first hand puppet maker, um, you know, moving mouth puppet maker on, on the website. And, and, you know, as it grew and as more people found it, you know, I tried my best to help people navigate it, you know, learning tags and SEO and all that stuff. Um, 
it it you know the fees really start to add up and a lot of us who started there realized you know i think i think it's time to move on to something different so i actually haven't listed a puppet on etsy in a lot of years um because i've got my own website so and and you know the it is just a chunk instead and i don't have to take a listing down or worry about where it's going to show up in a search i just again i just do my thing and if people find me that's great um I, I feel like I'm just in my little corner of the world having fun and hopefully people find the fun and want to have fun with me. Yeah. So, yeah. No, that's that's a really important point. And I, I, I think, too, especially back then, and as you said, you know, before the, all the fees and all that got out of out of hand, there's something really nice to be said about, like, having someone build the infrastructure for you. Or like, you know, that's what I love. Like I'm decent at web design, but I can't build a website to save my life. So like having something like a, a Weebly or a Squarespace or something like that to get you started is a really great tool. Um, and then being able to grow beyond that is obviously nice too. Yeah. And also too, like with stuff like that, I mean, this is this is the, the tragedy of, of artists is that like we just want to make art. And we'd love to sell art, but selling something is is a different mindset. You know, it, it's a business mindset. And a lot of uh, some artists are kind of lucky to have some amount of business aptitude. Uh, not that it even takes a lot to be able to sell something on Etsy or something. But then you start focusing on things that that take you away from the art. Like you said, going up to the listings, relistings and all things like that. And and it, it can it can take over too much to a point. To a point yeah. where it interferes to why you started to begin with. And that could actually be said about all of social media and really, I mean, so much of uh, the business side of of any art. I always say it's the Ernie well, brain versus the Burt brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it's it's what's the saying. It's, um, you know, if you if you do what you love, you'll never find time to sleep or <laughs> <laughs> you know like if you, you you'll be working 20 around the clock you you'll stay up worrying about whether or not you'll make your studio rent you know all these different yeah. things but but I, it does allow it i i can't sit in the office i can't i can't file things i can't you know i can't i can manage people but i don't want to manage people <laughs> You know, or or if I'm managing people, I want to manage creative people. Um, I don't want to hear about anyone's, uh, you know, synergy or, or you know, I don't want to have to put a pin in something and circle back. I don't <laughs> like office speak. I don't like meetings that should have been an email. <laughs> I don't like meetings that should have been an email. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and I really like, how do I eat is a really good question, <laughs> Like, but it's, but it's, you know, you, you have the job until the job is like, Hey, I don't know if we can continue to, I don't know if we can bring you back next year. And then you go home and you find that your friend that used to work at Etsy uh, years ago has sent you a surprise package in the mail that's full of books about doing it on your own and making your making your small craft business work you know like it's it's serendipitous moments it's you know well i don't know how i'm going to survive the year but i know how i'm going to survive the next six months or i know how i'm going to survive the next year but i don't know how i'm going to survive the next five years and then you hustle and you figure it out you know you, you have people believe in you and you have people say, do you do classes? And you say, you know what, when I look for a space, maybe I should get a space big enough that I can teach classes in person and I don't have to go to somebody's location anymore. Um, and then, you know, when, when you get an ice cream truck, you know, you think, well, maybe I could make it more useful than just a giant expensive art project. <laughs> so, so you have a studio uh, beside... Yeah the ice cream truck yeah so i moved into this space um six years ago this month um 
and and it's a 750 square foot art studio in downtown Phoenix. Um, and and this is the other thing. I don't live in an area where real estate is bonkers. Um, and and that's important. You know, I live in an affordable area. I couldn't do this in New York. I couldn't do right. this in L.A., but I can do it in Phoenix. Um, you know, I could do this in Longview, Texas. I could do this in, you know, another, you know, smaller. Well, not that Phoenix is small. We're the fifth largest city in the country. But, you know, we're not we're not known for being, you know, having really high living expenses. And so, you know, I, you know, you, you figure out, well, I'm making this much in this amount of space in my house. If, if my rent is, you know, however much I, I can cover that rent and then some with what I'm making at home. And if I'm in the studio, how much more could I make? Because, you know, at home I was working on our old dining room table and in my studio space, I, I am filthy with table space. Like, and my table, my table space is filthy. <laughs> like it's an embarrass. I have an embarrassment of of table space that that gets covered, but it allows me to create so much more. And you know, I didn't know how I was going to survive this pandemic, but but thankfully, you know, Zoom and you know all of these other things allows me to teach classes all around the world. I, I don't have, I don't have students just in Phoenix anymore. Now I have students in Spain and Canada and South, uh, South Africa and Australia. And it's really, it's really just incredible. I am, I, I, I do not discount the fact that I have been very, very, very lucky. Um, but I also think that it's important to say yes to opportunities when they arise. And I think that that's how I've been able to grow and how I've still been able to eat. Also, I'm married. We're a two-income household. You know, when, when Puppet Pie is struggling, you know, my husband has a steady paycheck. It's not, you know, I'm not a single person trying to do this. Yeah. yeah, we also are feeding teenagers, so there's that too. <laughs> You'll yeah. take a hit just with that. <laughs> yeah. um, well, yeah. no, but I, I, I think there's, there's, a, this is a beautiful illustration of the people who work the hardest are also the ones who get the luckiest, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's a one-two step. Again, of the, the, I love the saying it, it's uh, luck is preparation uh, plus opportunity. So yeah. as long as you're doing the work when the opportunity presents itself, you can take advantage of it. Other people sometimes get the opportunity, but they didn't do the prep, the back work that it takes to get there. So it really yeah. is, um, you know, it, it takes, it takes both. It's not enough and just to get lucky. People, people ask me how I got to Sesame street and I'm like, well, I, I went to a puppet festival in 2009 and I met my, well, no, I did. I said yes to hanging out at the puppet theater during a 2004 festival. Instead of attending the festival, I hung out and I, I house managed for the puppet theater and they had a guest artist that I became very good friends with. And then um, very tragically, he passed away uh, far too young and I went to his service uh, you know, uh, 12 hours away, it was important to me to go. And at the service, I was asked to go to another puppet festival to run the, the puppetry store. And at the puppetry store, I met people who, you know, learned about my background. And then I met those people again. And then the next thing I know, I'm on, you know, I'm that person tells somebody else who tells somebody else that, you know, maybe they should take a look at me for, for the role of Julia. And that's really how I got there. And had I, had I not said yes to bringing my nine month old down to the puppet theater to hang out, you know, n none of that would have, none of that would have happened. Um, it's, it's all being willing to say yes and, and being kind so that people want to help you too. I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about about Sesame Street, but I don't want to do that without jumping over because um, 
I, I think the first time I met you was at a P of A festival. I was going to say, um, I met you at the puppetry store, too. And I, I was going to say, and, and specifically as a fixture so. in the puppetry store. Yeah, I remember. I think you ran up to me. You're like, I know you. Yeah. <laughs> you post stuff on yeah. stuff online. I was like, oh, hi. You're like, you're very sweet and friendly. You're like, let's be friends. Um, but yeah, just uh, can you talk a little bit about like, I because I know plenty of people who go to festivals, but, um, you know, don't necessarily, uh, you know, step up in that way. So just how, how did all that, how did you fall into that? So one of my very, very dear friends is Art Gruenberger, and he oh, was at yes. the time serving on the board of directors for the, um, for the, pup, uh, the Puppeteers of America. And um, the I had gone to the festival in the past and worked at the puppetry store because the Great Arizona Puppet Theater used to house the puppetry store. That was, I mean, it was it was here. It was local. I got okay. access to books. Also, the the video library was the video lending library was also here at the time, and and you know talk about a privilege of just being able to go in and you know. I'm just going to grab this Lottie Reinecker film real quick. And, you know, just, hey, I'm just going to take this P of A festival film while where Jim and Frank are talking. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I w I'm very, very lucky, lucky, lucky kid. And uh, Art knew that I had worked in the festival store before. And he said, hey, we need somebody for the store. And I was like, yeah, I can, I can probably come help with the store. And he was like, well, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give your name over to Paul Robinson, who was our, um, who was our, uh, what was he? Paul Robinson from P of A. Yeah, he does membership now, I think. He Maybe. does membership now, but at the time he was our title. Fill in title here. <laughs> I don't know. It's on the so, lower third right under you, so. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So um, Paul Robinson from P of A contacted me and I he was like, hey, I heard you're willing to help out with the store. And I was like, yeah, you know, like, just let me know, you know, what what hours you need me. And he was like, oh, we wanted you to manage the store. <laughs> I was like, I can't yeah, tell, tell me the hours the you want. All of them. <laughs> we want you to do all, all of, of them. them. <laughs> That's right. All of them and beforehand. If, if you could just not go um, to any of the puppet shows. You know or... those plans you had? <laughs> right. Eraser board. That's right. Well, and and if I remember correctly, that year the festival was in August. It was 2015. And um, I think that's the festival where we met. That was, yeah, Swarthmore. Um, no, excuse me. That 15 was oh, no, UConn. Not 15 Strathmore. was UConn. Yeah, I was going to say it was UConn because I didn't go to Strathmore. Um, so, uh, yeah. So... I, I was like, I don't, I can't do this. This is too much. I can't do this, which is usually how most of my life ends up happening is somebody throws me in the deep end and they say, you're either going to swim or we're going to help you swim. Um, and, and that's kind of what happened. I, I went to art and I was like, you didn't say you wanted me to do the whole thing. And he was like, Oh, yeah that well we'll I'll help out I'll help out don't worry and I had a, I had a lot of emotional support and I I was able to talk to you know the people at the puppet theater and figure out how to do it so um yeah really the P of A needs volunteers and every festival I have gone to I have offered to volunteer it's something that I mean I'm I'm trying to think like my parents had me volunteering, painting apart low-income apartments when I was in junior high. I went to Mexico and built homes in high school. It was, you know, giving of my time has always been, uh, been instilled in me as a person. So, so seeing a need and filling a need was just kind of like okay. Yeah, okay, as long as I have the support, I can do this. I don't mind volunteering in the store, but now you want me to run it. Okay, I can do that too. Um, and yeah, it, it, it allowed me to go to the festival. You know, like working at Dragon Con allowed me to go to Dragon Con. Um, that's kind of how I viewed my ticket to places. I, I don't have the funds to just drop and say, 
yeah, I'm just going to go do this thing, except for the O'Neill that one year. <laughs> and, and yeah, working, working at the festival is a great way to fund yourself getting to the festival. It's um, so true. That's, that's yeah. yeah. And, 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 and it's also that by volunteering, it also gives you the opportunity that like, you can't complain if you, if you're not volunteering, like if you're not helping to make the thing a better thing, you, you can't, you know, be sitting in the corner and being like, this was terrible. This was poorly run. The food yeah. was bad. Like all that's all that kind of stuff. That's right. That's right. If, if, if I'm volunteering in the store, I can complain about the food. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but I mean like, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, Puppeteers of America is a volunteer run organization. Right. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm currently serving in my third year on the volunteer board um, the entire, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, you know, I have been, I have been, uh, we've had a lot of family changes in the last year, uh, or last couple of years. And I'm very fortunate that my, that my fellow board members have been able to support me in, in taking a little step back, even though I'm still very involved. I'm not, I'm not putting in 15 to 20 hours a week anymore, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's great things only happen when you're willing to help great things happen, you know, and, and if you can go in and say, Hey, look, I helped this great thing happen. I I've done that before in the improv community. You know, I helped found the Phoenix improv festival almost 20 years ago. It's, and, and I can look back and go, Hey, that's really cool. I'm not involved with it in any way anymore, but you know, I helped. I helped. I'm a helper. I love being a helper. Um, I don't always make it better, but I try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And it's important. It's important for people. You know, if you want something to happen, contribute to it. Everybody. Everybody needs help. Yeah. No. And 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 take it take it beyond that too cuz I, I one thing i what i wouldn't want to happen is people like um to i, I mean you have to be a member too I, that's why i think i'm trying I'm trying to get at too is uh oh, yeah. everyone should really be a member if you're interested in puppetry at all you want to be part of the community there's no better way to really get connected and get more information from it than to to than than, than to be a part of it and the membership is very very inexpensive and like we said it's all volunteer yeah. based so that goes directly just into right. maintaining um all the contributions that they make to uh, puppetry in america i mean let, at the bare minimum yeah. our whole series that we did earlier uh was uh to help the the relief fund too that was something that they did for the puppetry community is giving small grants to puppeteers uh who needed it during a time of need in the pandemic so I mean, there's yeah. just, there's so much I, great things to come, and 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 again, it, it, the hard thing is that you know artists, it's a group for artists, and artists tend to not have a lot of uh, resources or money to begin with. So sometimes it's hard to yeah. to justify the expense. But like I said, it is so small, and you get so much value out of it, and it's su such a a long standing legacy to be to be a part of. Um, and it preserves the art form yeah. too, because they're maintaining the archives exactly. and, and all. I mean, just a myriad of things. Yeah, um, it's it's invaluable. I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking for my latest issue of the Puppetry Journal. Oh, um, it's probably on my desk, which means I'll find it in like three weeks. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's sitting on my coffee um, table at home. <laughs> Oh, that's a lovely place to put it. I bring them to my studio because, well, when people came in, it was really important for me to have have it out. You know, yeah. we we publish a quarterly there's a quarter, quarterly magazine called the Puppetry Journal that has been in print consistently since the 30s. Yeah. Since the 1930s. Like our organization, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. It is it is really, really fantastic. Like we are preserving it. Where it's, it's. What do we say? It's, it's um, knowledge preservation and inspiration, and that's, and that's what you get from being part of the organization. You know, you, you gain knowledge. You know that you're helping preserve this really wonderful art form, and 
you're I'm I'm consistently inspired by what our members are doing. You know, I can remember I can remember before I knew Art Gruenberger. Now we're very good friends, but before I ever knew him, I got a puppetry journal with his show Man of La Mancha in in puppets on the cover and it was I was just so fascinated and mesmerized by these gorgeous puppets that weren't the traditional hand uh, glove puppets or moving mouth puppets that I was used to. It was these, you know, l almost life size. Uh, well, everything is life size, like like person sized puppets it's that were being performed show. on a stage. Yeah. It is so stunning, and and you know, thinking back to to that Stacy, you know that. 2006 2007 Stacy I I never dreamed that I would be you know such good friends with both the puppet builder and the the director slash performer and and it's my first puppet festival was in 2007 and the number of friendships and even just uh you know colleagues that that I respect and can call friends is I mean it's probably the majority of people I know <laughs> like <laughs> it's so wonderful and then and then you bring that out to places like Gen Con or Dragon Con um, where there are puppet programs or puppetry track and you know you don't have to be a member to be to go to those but but it's it's almost the same feeling you're being an, amb the, an the ambassador you make. In, in those senses. Yeah, abs absolutely. Absolutely. It's, well, and then the neat thing, especially th thinking of being an ambassador to it, is we get a lot of people. So I run the, I run the puppet program at Gen Con, which is a board game convention in um, Indianapolis. And we get a lot of people who aren't puppeteers, whereas a puppet festival, you've kind of got to be committed, right? Like, I'm going to spend <laughs> you gotta money be ready for on that. puppetry. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Nobody accidentally wanders into a puppetry no. festival. <laughs> you know, not, yeah. So, and but people do stumble upon puppetry at conventions, right. at you know, at Dragon Con, they'll go, oh, well, I'm here because I wanted to see Karen Prell talk about this video game that she animates. But I had no idea that she was also Red Fraggle and that I had no idea that there were all these like amazing programs happening at other times here. Or at Gen Con, I had one of my f my favorite groups of people. Um, they came into one of my finger puppet making workshops as punishment to their junior high kid for making them go to an event they didn't want to. They oh, were like, well, no. we're going to make you make puppets. That's fun. They didn't tell me that to begin with. <laughs> But then they had so much fun. They bought extra kits to bring home. And then they came to every single one of our events. And they have been at every single one of our events since. Not only that, one year they came to Gen Con in cosplay of a finger puppet they bought from me. Oh, my gosh. Wow. They turned this. It was a, it was a radical moose lamb. It was a moose. Moose. Mm -hmm. There's a photo the on the screen for people who yeah. <laughs> need the visual. Lamb. Okay. So and but he but he came in this costume, but it wasn't of a moose lamb. It was of a moose lamb finger, finger puppet. puppet. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Like the, the giant hole at the bottom. So does that mean they and had it was a made finger costume felt. on underneath too? <laughs> like you you'd need to go all the way. I'm going to I'm going to suggest that to him yeah, next that's, time. That's the next step. That's yeah. Next level. Yeah. Wow. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. No, I mean, it's one of those things like I think I mean, that's kind of my trajectory with it, too. It's just like 
puppetry is like it's just you don't know what you don't know, right? And then like once you, d- it's literally it's like getting bit by a vampire. You just like that you turn into a vampire too. That's what that's what really yeah. discovering the other side of puppetry. That's cool. I knew what puppetry was. I knew what a puppet was, but not until that I really saw like like for me it was really kind of seeing some behind the scenes footage and stuff of like of like Muppet and Sesame Street. I'm like, wow, like this is awesome. Of course, I had already had the theater background, but like, yeah, that's when I got got bit by the vampire of puppetry. Bit by the puppet vampire. Yeah, yeah no, his totally. name's the Count. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, that's where I, I got bit by the Count. Nice. Yeah. That's right. Or or the thing that's from right. Sarah Marshall, I suppose. There's oh, two yeah. of them. Yeah, those are those are those are something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speak speaking of uh, Sesame, we mm-hmm. would of course be remiss. Uh, if we didn't talk about uh, your association with the Julia, and you kind of talked a little bit about um, how you how you got there, but um, can you just talk a little bit about uh, when you first knew that that was happening? I mean, that that character just exploded onto the scene in such a wonderful way. Um, I'm sure you were sitting on it for quite a time before the world got to meet her. But just what what what's that story for you? Well, the neat thing is the world got to meet her at the same time I met her. And that was through a storybook online. She was only going to be a storybook character. And I literally scoured the internet to find out which of my friends would be performing her on the show. And I found an article that said she's not going to be a character on the show, which was fine. But then it was just like, oh, man. I kind of had the realization that she looked like me. Um, you know, I I had Julie, Julia's same haircut as a child. I can, you know, we can throw a photo up on the screen of that too. It's, it's a little, it's right it's here. A little uncanny. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I just kind of, I literally looked up at my ceiling fan and I was like, hey, universe. I would like this someday. And I, I of course, never thought that would happen. I mean, they didn't know me. I'd been rejected from Sesame Street uh, workshops in the past. I've been told so many times by people who have taken workshops from them that I'm far too short to be a puppeteer on their show. Like, there's no way. But, like, well, that's a fun pipe dream. Just, like, I wanted to open up a, a theater in my hometown out of the old Barnwood restaurant. And, you know, that's not going to happen. They tore it down and put in a Starbucks. Like (laughs) that's the same, it's the same kind of, same kind of dream, but you know, maybe I'll know someone, you know, who's on it and that'll be really cool. But just, just knowing the character existed was just the bee's knees. I mean, and I'd wished that it had been around prior um, because my son was beyond Sesame Street years at that point. But um, I was, so several months later, I, I was sitting here in the studio sewing some puppets. My friend was sitting across my desk. She was working on a project. And and I got an email. I had just signed up for Sesame Street and autism emails uh, because they had just launched the character the pr- prior October. And um, I see, I see, I get an email from Sesame Street, and it says um, something about autism, their autism initiative. And I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna click that. That'll be fun." And I see the little thing, dear Stacy, and it says, "You come highly recommend." <laughs> and then you know, this dot, isn't dot, from dot. Mailchimp, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Well, and I thought, well, they can put my name in. That's that's. Yeah, I yeah. do that at Mailchimp. <laughs> I never do, but I can. Um, and yeah, so it was just one of those like I'm 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 just opening a regular old email, and it was one of their one of their people saying, "Hey, can you send? You know, can you tell us about your your life with autism? Uh, can you tell us?" And I thought, well, that's really cool. They're seeking out parents. They want they want parents' opinions. You know, that's great. I didn't realize that they were, they couldn't get enough, so they're getting mine. <laughs> like, <laughs> why would they ask me? So I just, I sent an email back and then she said, great. Uh, can you send us a video? And I was like, what? <laughs> um, and I sent them a video and then they 
asked me to audition. They sent me some sides and I recorded them. And what was in that video that you sent them? Yeah. Okay. So I, um, it was just basically, oh gosh, what was in that video? Did they give you guidelines for that video? I'm sure when they did the audition, there was guidelines, but just for the video, did they just say, yeah, send yeah, us the yeah. video? No. Yeah. So they asked, they asked for a pretty, pretty standard come in, look, look camera oh, center, sure. look at all the corners and then leave. Like that's yeah. all they want. Oh, and then they said, sing a song. Okay. And mm -hmm. so, um, my camera was broken that day. Oh. I have, I have a okay. DSLR. That's all I had. Um, and DSLRs are great, right? You can record video on it. I've recorded video on it before and I set it up and it would only record 10 seconds oh, no. what? and then it stopped. And I was like, what, what's going That's on? Why did it corner, stop? Corner, corner, corner. You know? <laughs> right, 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 right. And I, I was just like, what is happening? And maybe it was only five seconds. It was just like bloop and then it's done. And I was like, okay, well, uh, I need to go buy, I need to buy a, a memory card. Uh, that's what I'll do. I'll go get a memory card. So I ran over to Staples and this is all, I have to do this before I get my son from school. Like this has to happen in a certain time frame. So I, I go and I get the memory card and brand new memory card. Okay. We're rocking and rolling. Let's get this thing done. Still not working. <laughs> And I'm like, well, I can't, I can't do it on an iPhone. I need to see, I need to see what I'm doing. I don't have a monitor that can hook up to my iPhone. This, this won't work. Um, and I ended up, I ended up calling a friend. Oh, I ended up calling a friend just to see if they could, um, if they could come over and hit play for, or hit, hit record. You know, I was like, okay, I've got the, I've got the thing. My friend is here. Let's do this. And it wasn't working. And then we did have to record on their iPhone. Um, we recorded a, a little bit. Um, my, and they had their, their nonverbal son with them. Um, or mostly nonverbal son. And I, we, we plopped their son up on, on a table to get him higher and and we sang twinkle twinkle little star together maybe we we sang a couple songs together and interacted and that i counted that as my song and i and i then had to have another friend come over with um because they i had to go get my kiddo before we could do the other bit um and uh i had another friend come over with his video camera and and we recorded it later that evening but it was it was such it was such like oh my gosh that like sesame street needs this from me and of course they need it right now and of course they didn't need it right then but in yeah. my mind yeah, they needed right, it yeah. they needed it before the end of the day like yeah. and i I sent it off that night and I was like, I'm so sorry that it took me so long to get this to you. Like literally thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe it took all day to do this. Yeah. And they were like, oh, I, we, I'm surprised we have it. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say you took the puppet to Staples and just filmed on one of the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Oh my gosh, that would have been so smart. Which, uh, which, which puppet did oh, you use? Oh man. I used my, I used Claire. So, um, the, there's a sheep right back here. Mm. Um, and her name is Claire. She's from a web series that I did for a board game company. Oh, okay. Um, uh, that was called the Bob and Angus show. We had like six viewers. It was really nice, but they, they let us go for like five years. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. It was for, for the same company that created settlers of Catan at the time. Wow. Or they they licensed the U.S. Settlers of Catan and you know assembled yes. it. That's so cool. That's so crazy. It. Yeah, yes, it's, it's funny because like no matter yeah. how much of this stuff you do, yeah, when there's a deadline, stuff always just happens and comes up at that moment. Like of course today, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah. that's, that's such a fun well, story. And I have to say, I've taken my camera into the place twice, and nobody can figure out why it still it still only records like five six seconds at a time. So. I, I have different cameras now. I've good, good. I've learned the wonders 
the wonders of the pawn shop. <laughs> right. but, uh, and so, not only that, but you got the part. <laughs> that's right, you got I the part. Did. Well, speaking of which, I, 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 didn't, I wanted to keep it going with that, too. Then you said you went to, to New York City, right? So, yeah, I went to New York for, for the audition, and um, Pam and Leslie, Pam Marciero and Leslie Carrara Rudolph just absolutely were the kindest people on the planet, just so encouraging. Um, they were the ones that, that gave my name, and, you know, they were the ones cited in the email. Uh, and it was... It was probably one of the best days of my life, you know, like uh, they both came with me to the audition. They they let me go in by myself. They just but we had lunch at, at Lincoln Center beforehand. And then afterwards, we went out and we had we had a drink and we went and saw a Broadway show, which I'd never been to a Broadway show before. And, you know, they just showed me New York and. It was it was a magical magical day, and I I went in I went into the audition, and I met um, the other two ladies at the callback who are now really really good friends of mine, and I just it the place is just filled with so much love, and I was so intimidated by Matt. I don't know if Matt listens, but Matt, I was so intimidated because he's so tall. <laughs> and I just thought, well, this is the moment I, he said he introduced himself. I, what was going through my mind was, well, this is the moment that he tells me I'm too sh that I'm too small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is Matt Vogel, I, we yeah. presume. This is Matt Vogel, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's the puppet captain and plays Big Bird and The Count and lots of others. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it was... And, and, you know, honestly, I've got, when I first opened my studio, I, I was unpacking um, a box that I'd been given, uh, just of random stuff, could I use it? And in there was a little purple, um, so it's a little, it's a little purple picture frame. And I, I opened it up when I was, when I was first here six years ago, I opened it up. And I grabbed a piece of paper and I wrote the word play on it because I wanted to remember just to play. I didn't want to get overwhelmed with running a studio, with paperwork, with worrying about how I was going to keep this place open. Um, because I feel like when you play, someone else will come alongside you and play with you. And... That's what I had in mind when I went into the little studio at on Broadway, you know, uh, it uh, Broadway Street, not Broadway Theater. Um, I I just wanted to play. I was like, this is as close as I'm gonna get. I am as close as I'm gonna get to Sesame Street. Pam was bringing me to the set that following Monday. I was going to get to go, you know, it, all I needed to do was go in and play and be really happy for one of the other two gals when they got the part, you know, because there's, I'm, I was self-taught. I'd had monitor experience, but it was on a web series, you know, that we filmed out of somebody's, you know, bedroom, <laughs> like, not bedroom, but like a, it was a, it was like their office. It was a small, yeah. small room before before we moved to a studio. It was for many years. It was filmed in this tiny little space, and we filmed one day a month for like five years. And and I, I was just like I, I was talking to Pam beforehand, and this is where that phrase comes from. I said, I was really worried, and I said, Pam, what if I get it? And she said. <laughs> She's, I said, are they going to give me classes? And she said, no, they're going to throw you in the deep end and you're going to swim. And if you don't swim, we're going to help you swim. And that, that's exactly what they did. They threw me in the deep end and then they helped me swim. Wow. Um, yeah. And yeah. Goosebumps there. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's like... 
Yeah. Holy cow. That's incredible. It's like the uh, end of Willy Wonka. Like, <laughs> what, <is> the, <laughs> yeah. remember what happened to the, to the person who suddenly got everything they ever wanted? They lived happily <laughs> ever after. <laughs> yeah. It was the lady with well, the ice cream truck that works on Sesame Street. <laughs> it's like, that's, 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 that's yeah. about it. <laughs> well, and, and that's what it felt like. It was like, you know, as a kid, my goal was to be a butterfly on Sesame Street. And in the Meet Julia episode, I think I had mentioned that to Marty or Marty found out somehow. And he made sure that I got to be a butterfly in a scene, you know, like he was like, you're going to stand here. Here's how you're going to wiggle your butterfly. And it, so it's the scene where Julia's Julia's up uh, in this area and she looks down at Big Bird walking and she starts laughing because he's a big, big bird. Um and there's a little butterfly on the left, on the right side of the screen, and, and and you can barely see it, but that was me, and that was me. I mean, like, of course, fulfilling my dream being Julia. Like, but that all I wanted, I I hadn't set the goal any higher than that. I thought being a butterfly was like good enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that's incredible. Yeah. And um, then I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of Julia holding a butterfly, but it was right after that that somebody um somebody saw oh, it was it was me talking to Marty about the butterfly in the previous episode that we'd filmed. Um cuz they put me in they put me into one before we did the big one, which was really smart of Matt. I mean like so smart. Give me some background like time and Julia's in her little raincoat and there's a butterfly sitting on her hand and that butterfly was Marty um because he knew he knew my little butterfly thing so yeah beautiful yeah it's like the warm fuzzies all over the place um I I'm curious and if this is something you'd you know would rather not talk about or if you're not able to but um you mentioned how the character was, um, you know, pre- previously established, and of course, you're working with the the curriculum and and what people have have set up. But how much um, were you able to bring your own experience with your child who has autism and um, into developing, you know, her her personality or even the way in which she spoke? Like, how much of that was? provided by the script and how much were you able to have any um personal input from your own you know your your own story with autism so i think i think that sesame street oh gosh they're just so good their research department is just so top notch good um yeah they um they brought i think most i mean it's so hard when you're not creating a character from scratch. Like, I want to honor what they're doing. Absolutely. That is my job. My job is to honor what they are doing. But my job as a puppeteer and our jobs as puppeteers is to bring some authenticity. So, so it's not just an anxiety attack. It's an anxiety attack that I have experienced. I know what that's like. I know what I know what anxiety is. And I also know what it looks like for my son. And I also know what it looks like for Bethany, who's the little girl that I I was a habilitator prior to having my chi- my child. I was a therapist, a paraprofessional for children uh who mostly nonverbal children uh with autism. So I, I know, and there's these two kids that I worked with the most, obviously, like the most, most being my, my own child, but, but the second most being Bethany, who is now, gosh, 23, 24, something like that. Um, she, she, I would say, is a lot like Julia. In cadence, um, when I got the job, I texted Jen, her mom, and I said, can you send me tapes of her? Like, we used to record her on this little, um, on a little, uh, you know, those Fisher-Price microphones. Mm-hmm. And 
I, I was like, do you still have those? And she was like, I do. And I, and they're digitized. Oh, and so she sent me those and I listened, I listened to those over and over and over again. Um, and I remember, I remember what Bethany was like. I remember what my son w is, is still like, you know, like, um, the, the, we called them birdie hands or butterfly hands. Uh, that's what, you know, when he's really excited or Bethany's really excited or, or worried, it's just a processing thing. And, and we were, I'm lucky enough that I was involved with families who did not want to quell that. Um, it's, it's a lot of, you know, if, if there's something that I think Julia would say, it's, you know, Hey, when we're going over a script, I say, Hey, do you think Julia could say this here? You know, and I, I try really try and draw from my own experiences, um, and what I, what I saw, um, Bethany and my son do, um, to, to bring her to life in the most authentic way I can. Um, I have a few autistic traits, not enough to be labeled autistic, but I don't look at people in the eye. I, I mean, I cheat and I look at people's mouths and noses. Mouth, like if I'm not looking at your mouth, it's really hard for me to tell what you're saying. Like, so you guys right now, I'm looking at your video and I'm watching your mouths. Um, but looking at, I don't know, looking at you in the eye is really hard. <laughs> so even, even over a webcam. So yeah, it's just, I, I know what that's like. I know I can remember Bethany, you know, looking down and, and talking to me and then just staring at me and just drinking in every ounce of my face. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, we all, I fidget, I stim. To you know, that's what that's what I'm doing down below the camera as I'm rubbing my little fingers together, <laughs> um, and and so I I give I try to give those things to Julia in an age appropriate way with the things that she has. We know that she has Fluffster, so you know she'll take Fluffster, and especially if we're doing something in person, you know she'll take Fluffster and she'll she'll rub Fluffster on her eyelashes. I also play with my eyelashes a lot. Um, uh, so she'll she'll rub Fluffster's ears on her eyelashes and, you know, just kind of get that little thing going, that little stim. Um, just a self-soothing thing or where her attention and focus is. And a lot of it's been a huge learning process over the last five years of doing it. So you asked, you know, you, met, you alluded to how long I might have had to keep this under wraps. It was a year. Yeah. Um yeah, I worked there for a year before I could say what I did there. And so until then, I was like, I'm a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It was the um, truth, but not the whole yeah. truth. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. It was the truth. It was wow. the truth. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, autism, uh, you know, kids who have autism or really anyone who has autism, there's such a spectrum. There's so it can be portrayed in, you know, so many different ways. Is there an initiative to show other sides of autism? Oh my gosh, yeah. And even when they launched when they launched Julia, they also launched a ton of videos online showing kids different kids. Yeah. Because, you know, there's a saying in the autism community, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Exactly. You know, one autistic person is one autistic person. My son's best friend is also autistic. Their their autism is different for each other. It's awesome that he does have an autistic best friend because they do get each other. They understand when one of them is having a hard time with something that they aren't necessarily having a hard time with. Um, and that's kind of how we should all be. Yeah. Um, if there's so many misnomers about autism, you know, people will say autistic people don't value relationships. Well, that's not true. Autistic people aren't empathetic. Well, that's not true. You know, autistic people don't communicate the same way you communicate. That is true sometimes, you know, like right. yeah. Yeah. it's, 
it's it is no, so yeah. no, different. I, I, and, I connect with what you're saying because, like, you know, being a school teacher, yeah. I work with all types of different students, and all different uh, yeah. types of students have different forms of autism. And it is, yeah, it's it, exactly right what you said. You met one person with autism, you've met one person, and that's why I was kind of asking yeah. that question. Is like, because uh, I can see people saying like. Yes, this person is autistic, but I don't feel represented by them. Like, uh, is there any initiative sure. to like to show other? You know, what what can they do, and and like, what would that potentially look like? I wonder. So, so what it currently looks like is there are people, uh, there are videos of children who are nonverbal. There are videos of children who are more verbal than Julia. There, uh, there are so many. I don't know if people realize that number of online resources that Sesame Street and Sesame and Communities has, it's so vast. I remember when they first launched Julia, they launched they launched activity cards, which is a, 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 a nonverbal way of, of laying out a kid's day, like a routine card. Well, first, we're going to brush our teeth and it shows maybe Elmo brushing his teeth. Then we're gonna then we're gonna put on our socks. Then we're gonna you know then we're gonna get dressed. And what it what does this entail? Um, it, it's a picture assisted communication has been something used in the autism community for a very very long time. And Sesame Street is providing essentially a form of that with these with these resources. Um, they are they are they are showing families who have who have children who have different needs who need different levels of support um and that is important they show julia using her her talker her picture assisted ipad um which i won't even get into like back in the day how expensive those were and now we have them on our phones and how awesome that is. I did just get into it, but um, <laughs> you know, and and Sesame Street realized um, with Julia, and and this is I think you can find this in interviews with different various people online. They they realized they had to pick a lane. You know, they yeah. had mm-hmm. to just say, and 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 Alan says, you know, Big Bird says, what's what's going on? You know, what's autism? And he says, well, for Julia. It looks yeah. like this. Yep. And and that that for Julia, those two words are the most important part of that show. Yeah. Yep. Um, for Julia, it looks like this. You know, she may take a little bit of time to respond. She doesn't like loud noises. She eats bananas with a fork. Um, she likes them sliced up and with a fork. Um, she likes water sprayed on her face. I do not jive with that one, but that's, that's one, you know, like that's not personally, I can't stand water on my face, but, (laughs) but I try, I try and act like I do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, it, it's, and, and beyond that, you know, we have different ways of processing information. Um, neuro, neurodivergent and neurotypical people have different ways of processing information and different ways of communicating di- di- you know, information. And beyond that, we're all people who experience all of the emotions. You know, it's at my house right now, I've got, two autistics and two neurotypical kids hanging out with each other in this very moment. Mm -hmm. And they are getting along just fine because they're giving each other grace and understanding and empathy, all of them. And I, I, from, from my perspective, the empathy is one of the most important things you could teach because just being able to see and have an understanding maybe not even understanding but just having that understanding of you know uh, what what I'm experiencing is not what another person's experiencing and that's okay um and and being open and receptive to that um I think is just invaluable how much yeah 
How much easier would it be for little kids in grocery stores and mothers of little kids in grocery stores and fathers of little kids in grocery stores and non-binary parents of little kids in grocery stores who are having a meltdown if somebody just looked at it, looked at them and went, man, I get it. Being little is hard sometimes, you know? Adam, you've got a little. Being sure little do. is hard. Yeah. Being little is so hard. Like, man, first of all, you come out and it's bright. You know? Like <laughs> and it's cold. <laughs> and it's cold and it's dry. Like, what's up with that? And then you've got to learn you've got to learn a language and you're you're you know, dealing with your vision changing and your body changing and your center of gravity changing. And then, like, there's this toilet you've got to figure out. <laughs> and it makes a giant horrible sound. And then they put you on solid food. And you've got to, you know, it, there's so many. They keep so pushing many... the goalpost back. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I like, I like to look at, I, I love working with preschoolers and kindergartners. Like, I love that age so much. And, and when somebody's having a meltdown and an adult doesn't understand, I try and just look at them and say, listen, this kid didn't speak English three years ago. You know, like they're new here. Give <laughs> yeah. them a break. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, it's, which is one reason I'm so thrilled to work with Sesame Street because that's like the target age, right? It's that, mm -hmm. that, hey, they're new here. Let's just help them out. <laughs> Well, and that's that's, that's yeah. yeah. Let's show them that the, in, in this world there's humongous eight foot birds that walk around and and you know, red monsters and no, I'm just kidding. And, yeah, and I, yeah, I, yeah. I that'll really confuse them. <laughs> hey, number. <laughs> hey, kid. Look, learn numbers from this fictional kid. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no, and I I joke with my you know because I've got grandparents who I help take care of and. You know, sometimes you go over and you have to help them with their HDMI input or with getting solitaire right back on the on the iPad or whatever. And it's like the joke in the family is like, well, they taught you how to use a spoon. So, like, you can help them understand right. which remote works what <laughs> box. That's right. That's exactly right. That's if we point. all just had some if we all just had some gosh darn empathy, you know, for each other, like. Man, just driving home would be easier. Yeah. yeah. You know, traffic would be easier. Man, yeah. How long has that person been driving a car? I don't know. Could be their like, first time. Could be their first time. I have friends who didn't drive cars until they were in their 30s because they grew up in New York and didn't need to, you know? Right. Or it's their um, first time in 14 months because there's been a pandemic. Because <laughs> there's been a pandemic. Or, you know, somebody had a bad day. I mean, kids kids cry because they didn't get the pink cup, right? Like, <laughs> I wanted the pink cup. All that is is just expectation and disappointment. You know, my expectation was not met. And, and that happens all the time as adults. My expectation was not met that my kid's room would be clean and now I am upset, you know? <laughs> like, it's okay. I didn't give them the pink cup when they were little. <laughs> like, we're all, we're all just muddling through. Well, uh, Stacy, we could talk for, for hours and hours, and um, this has been such a wonderful chance to um, get to know you better. Um, I know we've we've met at different things, but it's you know to have this time and opportunity has been just so lovely. Um, I wonder before we we wrap up, something that we ask everybody in the spirit of Mr. Jim Krupa, if you have a good puppeteer story that you could share with us of a time where something didn't go quite right in the moment that you wanted to pull your hair out and just cry. But now looking back, we could have a good, good laugh about it. <laughs> so, Oh gosh, I, I want to tell a story that's going to get me fired from the great Arizona puppet theater. Um, I mean, I haven't worked there in, you know, over a decade, but <laughs> Statute of limitations. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, Statute of limitations. <laughs> Sorry, Nancy. So when I was first working for them, I was going around and I was doing this this um, show about water conservation. We live in a desert. It is dry here, and it, water conservation is very important when you live in a desert. So very important anywhere. 
Um, and there's part of a show. It's it's a it's a tabletop. You know, I'm I'm dressed in blacks, and it's a tabletop show. Uh, where we're not really on a tabletop, but kind of. And I've got, um, it, we're in a bathroom is kind of the setting. Like there's a sink behind me and a window. And the shade gets pulled down and becomes a shadow puppet screen for an overhead projector. And I was in the middle of doing the show. Oh, I had set up my show. And then the school came in and they said, you know what? We actually don't want you set up here where we told you to set up. We're going to have you set up in another place that happened off almost happen more, more often than you'd think. Yeah. Um, we're going to have you set up in this classroom that is now a storage room. Um, so there was storage things everywhere. And I was really like, how am I? I had to move furniture. And then like the kids were coming in. And I had to get set up really, really quickly. And it's like and haphazard. And you're answering it's questions haphazard. at the same time. Yeah. I'm literally, yeah, I'm literally surrounded by stacks of desks and stacks of chairs. So like, I'm like, where can the kids sit that these aren't going to fall on them? And it was a really, it was a really small group. It was just one classroom, maybe, maybe two. And, you know, they're going to be sitting on the floor and I'm over here. And I go back around the backside of the stage to do the shadow puppets. And I realize I have not set up the shadow screen at all. <laughs> and... I need to do this show and it needs to be done in a certain amount of time because the bell is going to ring and everything. And so I don't, I don't remember what I vamped, but I vamped and just kind of made stuff up as I'm, you know, you're backstage and you're like, okay, and I need to get this. I need to like sneak my arm out and get the extension cord. And like, <laughs> it's probably, um, yeah. Sorry, Nancy. <laughs> at the great Arizona Puppet Theater. Oh I I really I, I did. I pulled it off. I, I did it. I vamped and I got it done. But um that was that's probably the most embarrassing moment of my puppetry. <laughs> my puppetry. That's where career. the good improv training comes in. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. It's yeah. it's all okay. And then I have characters backstage talking to each other. <laughs> I, I see that as a win. You didn't yeah. panic. Yeah, That's exactly. A, I mean, other people would panic. That's great. You want to shut the show down? I'm so and... glad to hear that. Oh yeah, I know. I <laughs> yeah. I didn't I didn't shut the show down at all. Gosh. Oh, I have one <laughs> other puppeteer story. Oh, Can please. I tell it? Please. Yeah. Okay. So I was working at Walt Disney World in the character department. Um, the I, I did the Walt Disney World College program in '98, and in the summer of '99, I went back and I did characters. And I was chipmunk height, which also meant that I was, um, I was. That's what they call Cam, too. He's chipmunk height. <laughs> chipmunk height, yeah. I've been yeah. saying that so they... for, to him for years. <laughs> I didn't they... even know about the Disney connection. <laughs> yeah, so so the, the, the shortest people are, the shortest people are, are duck height, and then it goes mouse height, then chipmunk height, then Pluto height, then goofy height. Um that's that's the those are the categories of of height so i was chipmunk height and which also meant that i was seven dwarves height and i i did a lot of seven dwarves and every now and again somebody somebody got the great idea that we should go from the area where we typically did autographs off of in a little alcove off of main street and we should march around to I think it was like, I think it was at the time Bell's storybook area. And we in we wore blues um, underneath. It was like standard issue, just like T-shirt and shorts and a sweatband that you'd wear uh, over, you know, on your forehead. Because otherwise sweat would, sweat would drip into your eyes. You'd wear that underneath. Every, everyone wore the same thing underneath their costume. Um, and... As we were, right before we were walking along, my headband slipped and it was here. Like I could see out of one eye, almost like a pirate. And then as we're marching and I, and I told my, I, there were different hand signals we had to do. So you'd cover your eyes if you couldn't see, you'd stamp your foot three times if you needed help. 
I needed help, but we were marching. Oh, I was, uh... I was playing, I was playing bashful at the time. Oh, <laughs> of course. So of course you'd have it's your the perfect <laughs> storm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I, okay. So I was playing bashful and I, we always had, we always had a, a friend with us. We always, has a, we always had a handler. And so I turned to my handler and I said, I need help. I wasn't supposed to talk, but like I, I shouted through the costume. I need help. It's too loud. They can't hear me. The parade music is going. So I march along, you know, hi, ho, and we get there. And then there's stairs I have to navigate up. And I am I have my eyes covered and I'm like, I can't see anything, you know, pantomiming all of this. And they're like, bashful, so bashful. Look at that. And I'm like, and and it is it is at a point where like children are coming up to me. They they put us up on a stage and then they let a line of kids come through. And children are coming up to me now. They they led me upstairs. I tripped. I, I tripped and I fell and I scraped my knee through the costume. Like it was really, it was really smarting. And I, I just needed somebody to take me backstage, allow me to take my, my head off, readjust. And then, you know, I could go back out. I would be fine. But like, I couldn't see anything. I, I couldn't see a pen to grab nothing. And so I'm, I'm doing this. And then I stomp my foot down three times and I stomped on a little girl's <gasps> foot and she oh, cried. Oh, oh, it was the, that maybe was the worst. I think yeah. that was the worst. Yeah, that actually Give Bashful a break. He only learned how to speak English three months ago. <laughs> That's right. I know. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Man. So That's they they actually one. led me off. They led me off because I made a, cry, a child cry, <laughs> and they were like, "What's going on?" And I was like, "I can't see anything." <laughs> I meant to say, my wife has this story that traumatized her when a character, a bashful character, stomped on her foot when she was at Disney. It all connects the dots. You know what? No. It all connects the dots. You know, and Maria looks me. like she Stacey. was never the same. <laughs> she was never the same. That's right. That's right. Oh my, oh gosh. my gosh. That's so funny. This poor oh. little girl. This poor little girl. <laughs> so uh, that was that was a great that was story. Amazing. But uh, so, but what's the best way for people to find uh, find and follow more of your work? So the best way to find me is you. Well, there's so many ways they can find me. They can go to puppetpie.com. Um, pie, P-I-E as in the food, not the number. Although we do like the number very much. Um, and, or they can find me on Facebook under Puppet Pie. They can find me on Instagram under Puppet Pie. If they search Twitter for Puppet Pie, they'll probably find me. But I'm really bad at Twitter. So the best ways. Oh, and I have three TikTok followers. So they can Ooh. also find me as Puppet Pie on TikTok. By the um, end of this, you'll have five of them. Yeah. So. So, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yay. <laughs> we'll find you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they can they can find me so many places. But yeah, yeah. thanks. We'll have all if the information just... on the screen, and I feel like this is also a little bit of a commercial for the Puppeteers of America. Yes. So make sure to check <laughs> out uh, Puppeteers. Is it dot com or dot org? Dot org. Right, Puppeteers dot org. Puppeteers. It's Puppeteers dot org, and get your membership. Yeah. Um, if there's a note that you can leave in there, tell them that you heard it on the Puppeteers podcast um, with Stacy and. Gordon. With <laughs> yes, specifically with Stacy Gordon, yeah, and then yes. I will, then I will feel all warm and fuzzy inside when Paul Robinson says, "Hey, somebody mentioned you," <laughs> and someone mentioned him because we yeah. talked about him. Yes, yes that's so, right. And and wow, if you are so part cool. of the if you are part of the Puppeteers of America, know that there are a myriad of places that you could volunteer. There's lots of committees. We hop on Zoom, we hop on the phone, and we plan things out. We plan, you know, the the World Puppetry Day. We do we do fundraising. We plan festivals and communication and, and scholarship committees and nominations. And if you want to serve on the board, um, become a member. And after two years, we would be happy to have you run for a position on the board. 
Um, and you, you can make a difference too. I, if I can just tout my little difference that I made, um, I, I really wanted us to have an updated website and I was able to make that happen. And not only that, we have an app, so you can, yeah, we have an app, um, that you can be part of and it'll, it'll even show you your, um, it will show you your, uh, puppeteers of america membership card so you can see mine right there um and it is valid until june 19th so i know that i get to renew my membership soon (laughs) awesome (laughs) i love it well stacy gordon thank you so much this has been such a delight i cannot wait to have you back and um thanks for joining us on puppeteers thanks Thanks so so much much for having me we'll see you guys around see you soon soon bye Bye. We're at the end of another episode of Puppeteers, but the fun doesn't stop here. Visit puppeteers.com for show notes and links to projects mentioned in this episode. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PuppeteersPod, where we're posting new things every day. Puppeteers is edited by Matt Bowen and made possible thanks to viewers like you. If you enjoy this content, you can join our incredible Patreon patrons who are supporting the show for as little as $1 per episode. Those folks get access to early releases, uncut episodes, official Cup O tiers just like we use on the show, and can even submit interview questions for our guests. Go to patreon.com slash puppeteerspod to learn more. Another great way to support Puppeteers is rating and reviewing us on iTunes, leaving a comment or subscribing to this channel, or tell a friend about your favorite episode. Thanks again for joining us on Puppeteers Puppetry Shop Talk, in-depth interviews with the world's most passionate puppeteers. Hosted by me, Adam Krutinger. And me, Cameron Garrity. But yeah, no, if you didn't, I want to see this uh... part. <laughs> Cam getting his backpack yeah. together. Wait, are you bringing your mug home? Oh yeah, you he don't always let does. him use a mug. Me? You don't just keep his mug. You got a mug for we him. We used Give to. The guy a mug. I used. Oh no, 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 it's different. I used to keep his mug here. My his standards are too high. He would spray paint on this desk, but not put my mug away. No, so I there wouldn't. was an episode where I was drinking, and I was like, "Why does this taste like spray paint or barge?" And it was because it had been coated in spray. So I had to buy a second mug. Yeah. You gotta get those calluses on. You gotta not in my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't hope when bye, you drink Stacey. coffee it doesn't go to your lungs. All right. Bye, bye. Cam. See ya. Bye, Cam. <laughs> oh right. my gosh. Yeah.